Welcome back to Sikistan and welcome back to my whistle stop tour of the Liver King's scientific references in his new ebook. So recently, Brian Johnson, or the Liver King, or as the Liver King as he refers to himself, released somewhat of a kind of a pamphlet for his nine ancestral tenants, his kind of main things he promotes. And in those, I noticed he referenced about 43 different scientific studies, or scientific studies as we'll get to in a little bit. Now, before we get going, I just want to say, as I've said before in the past, any time this has come, this came up, I'm, I'm a big fan of this style of, uh, or this kind of lifestyle or the style of nutrition. Uh, I literally, I'm not joking you, this is a liver from a, a fallow calf that fist shot at the weekend. I've been eating heart and liver for years, you know, um, literally fits the test to like, <clears throat> anytime the last four or five years, anytime he goes out, I'll be like, if he's out by himself or if we're not out together or if I'm out or whatever, I'm always looking for the heart and liver, something I've been at for years. You know, it's, it's kind of, it is, I'm not saying I came up with it myself, but it's not because of Liver King. But I do really like the lifestyle. I do like the stuff he promotes. I also, unbeknownst to me, uh, I didn't realize the Liver King and Ancestral Supplements were the same company. So just to be clear, if I ever do a kind of day in the life video and I show you what supplements I'm taking or whatever, uh, I use Ancestral Supplements. They are Brian Johnson's or Liver King's uh, Descade Organs. I was introduced to those about two and a half years ago, well before Liver King came about from Paul Saladino. See, so he used those before he set up his own heart and soil company. Uh, I would like to use heart and soil, but you actually can't get them delivered outside of the US and Canada. They get stopped at customs, which is unfortunate. However, Ancestral Supplements do, uh, you know, they do make it to Ireland. So I use those. Uh, this is long before the, the Liver King had ever kind of started his whole uh, social media campaign. So I just wanted to say those before we get going. Uh, in, if in future something different comes up and someone sees that I'm using ancestral supplements and they're like, oh my God, you never said that. Even though I'm here to both support Liver King and tear apart some of his references. Because I wanted to do this because I know a lot of people won't have time. Uh, and a lot of people aren't going to look through every one of these references but I will, because I'm very interested in see. Now, we're not gonna go through all of these. What we're gonna do is we're gonna pick some of the more interesting ones I found, some of the very, very uh, novel things, some of the more interesting aspects of some of those references that will be the good, and then we're gonna look at the bad. So literally, some of the straight up bad references that either contradict what he's saying in the sentence, or just straight up don't support what he's saying, or they're just not even correct references, which um, is a little mildly irritating, but, needs to be noted. Why am I doing it? Because I think a lot of people won't have time to do this. I think it's certainly interesting. Um, I find the science behind this very, very interesting. I'm incredibly interested in the people who are far behind the lines of social media and are doing actual research on these kind of things and trying to come to the forefront of public health and are trying to see why are hunter-gatherer societies, for example, much healthier, far lower risks of cardiovascular disease and all the aspects in that and without making it kind of magic-y and make it seem airy fairy they are actually looking into the actual biological mechanisms of why they're doing that and i was very interested in seeing some of the references here that he would have found that i might not have been aware of so there is some very interesting things from that some of them are quite surprising and then the others as i said aren't great so let's get to it we'll, we'll start with the let's start with the good because I, I i think it's probably a better way to start this and get into it so there's a lot of references. We're not going to go through ones, for example, where he talks about, for example, like the function of vitamin A, or there's some references on Native American sleeping habits and circadian rhythm. We know that stuff is fairly well grounded in science. It's, you know, it's nothing crazy. It's nothing that I'll read out to you or I'll have a look into and I'll tell you guys. And you're, you're all aware of that, like sleep waking cycles, um, you know, process food bad, get sleep on time, vitamins and minerals essential for life. The whistle sap kind of, the, you know you guys know that stuff there's no point talking about that thing so i'm going to look at some of the more novel aspects of some of these references so i'll read the quote from the liver king's ebook and then we'll go from there and we'll have a look at the reference so fun fact it is believed that our ancestors spent even sedentary periods in active rest so that's in quotations i.e the squat position so that takes us to number 18. so if we go have a look at number 18 it'll take us to the penis so is the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences of the United States of America. I'll be honest, I'd never actually heard of PNAS before, so I am 
unaware of the weight of the journal. Obviously, I would not have spent a lot of time when it comes to biochemistry or other aspects into uh, PNAS. So we, if anyone knows if PNAS is a weighty journal, let me know. So the research article is Sitting, Squatting and the Evolutionary Biology of Human Inactivity. So this is coming from the University of South California, Los Angeles. So the Human and Evolutionary Biology section, Department of Biology Sciences. So essentially, the researchers looked at the periods of rest at the Hadza, uh, which are a hunter-gatherer tribe in Africa, and one of the last few kind of hunter-gatherer tribes that live as close to what can be replicated for you know, the last several thousand years or has been as consistent as possible. And it's a very useful research opportunity for uh, researchers and evolutionary biologists and scientists to look at these things and see and relate it to public health and current state of human living. So one of the things uh, that's been kind of, you know, you'll have seen a lot in the last few years is kind of headlines that sitting is killing you or sitting is the new smoking. Or if you work in a corporate environment, for example, you'll have seen all of these softwares that have come up on your computer and they'll tell you to move every half an hour and do a lot of stretches and then get up and walk around. There's been a lot of back and forth and there's been a lot of good kind of science on both sides. Uh, there's a lot of reading for there if you want to go look for it. Essentially on one side, the, are the argument, and these particular authors are actually on this side of the argument, and there seems to be quite good evidence for that, is that sitting is reducing these particular biological activities in conjunction with the absence of more physical activity. So they're saying that particular aspects of sitting are causing the absence of particular biological things that are progressively useful for your health. Also on this side of the table, they make the argument that physical activity or rigorous exercise in conjunction with long time spent sitting will not make up for that time spent sitting. Now on the other side of the argument, there is people who are saying it's not really sitting that is causing the issue, it's really that the lack of stuff that you're not doing while you're spent sitting is causing the issue. So they're kind of saying it's more of a correlation with people who spend a lot of time sitting probably don't live as healthy or certainly not doing as much exercise as if it's only so many hours in the day. And so if they spend a lot of time sitting, they're probably not doing these other uh, rigorous activities. So the authors of this article are more in favor of that the sitting itself is causing an issue and in the absence of sitting or the absence of physical activity when you're in a sitting position and the biological mechanisms are causing those issues and will be detrimental to your health. So they looked at the Hadza. What they found essentially was that the Hadza actually had similar rest times or periods of uh, downtime in terms of in relation to industrialized society. So they had like UK, Australia and America in relation to those. The Hadza are in Tanzania for entering, entering wondering. And they found that basically they had similar periods of inactivity. However, the actions that the Hadza spent in their periods of inactivity were much different to the things people in the industrial societies, people watching this, do when they're in those periods of inactivity. So essentially what they found was that the Hadza spent time in active squatting positions, active kneeling positions, or assisted squatting postures. So these are things like, you know, you're sitting on the ground, you're sitting in a squat, you know, you are not sitting relaxed into a chair. So there's some evidence that sitting does have, sitting itself for long periods of time, does have negative biological effects. For example, one of these, and they reference it in this, is the lowered production of enzymes that uh, metabolize or hydrolyze lipids in your blood. So this is quite well documented. Is that when you're sitting, these enzymes are much less active, and I think the production of these are much less common. So there's probably more of these, and I'm sure these become more apparent as time goes on. However, one of the things, for example, it was quite interesting that the active rest positions that the Hadza were spending time in, the muscle activation was actually in some periods as close to 20 to 40% of the muscle activation of walking. So even in their rest, they're near, nearly half as active as they are when they're sitting. And the authors are making the argument that you cannot make up for these several hours a day. There's just no way you'd be able to exercise this much to eliminate the benefits of being in these active rest positions. The overwhelming evidence in favor of physical activity, intense physical activity being crucial for long-term health and the development of our species is almost up, not up for debate. And this is hugely contributing to that. So I think it's very, very interesting. Uh, something I've been paying close attention to is the kind of sitting argument. Um, it is quite interesting. For a period of time, I did seem to agree with, I would have agreed with the people who are saying that it's not really sitting that's causing the issue. It's just that kind of the absence of the activities that you're not doing while you're sitting is causing the issue. 
but it seems like you probably can't make up for that fully. So will I be getting rid of our sit there? or chairs in the office? Probably not. But if you do look at those researchers in their offices, if you look at universities, for example, a lot of them will have sit-stand desks. So take note of that. So I think this is quite interesting for anyone wondering. Um, sitting may be an issue, but I'll still probably be sitting in chairs. Sticking with the Hadza, we are going to go and look at um, the dietary activities or the dietary composition of the Hadza, so their macronutrient breakdown, which I thought was something that I'd never seen before and I thought was incredibly interesting. So the quote from this is, the high energy output of traditional peoples is directly associated with the evolution of our larger brains and badass endurance capabilities, 19. So that takes us to 19. So let's take a little, <whistles> little tour on over to number 19. And what's 19 taking us? That is taken to Wiley Online Library, uh, Obesity Reviews, World Obesity. It's titled Hunter Gatherers as a Models, Hunter Gatherers as Models in Public Health. So I uh, quite interesting title. This is coming from where is this coming from? Been cited 64 times. That's a fucking lot of citations for any article. So that's very, very interesting. And you know, that is uh that does add some weight to the article if a lot of people are referencing them. So they also looked at a variety of different hunter-gatherer tribes in Africa. Now there's a lot to this, it's very, very interesting, but one particular part I wanna go down to is their table one. So dye composition, blood profile, blood pressure in hunter-gatherers and other small-scale societies. So let's just take, because they have a full composite of the macronutrient profile breakdown of Hadza versus the US standard American diet. Um, so first off, we are protein. Percentage of the diet for protein for the Hadza was 24% of the diet. A quarter of the caloric intake was protein. And then in the USA, it was 12%. So the Hadza consumed twice as much protein as the USA. Actually, before we continue as well, it's just important to uh, you know mention why would we look at the Hadza? Well, hunter-gatherer societies have vastly lower rates of cardiovascular disease. We're talking like less than 1% in some circumstances. Their health span, uh, their quality of life until old age is very, very high. Their chronic diseases are very, very low. So it's not kind of appeal to nature fallacy. It's kind of well documented. So it is really, really worth looking at what they're doing. So success does leave clues. So I think it is, uh, it's not an appeal to nature fallacy to say, you know, the kind of, uh, that, that kind of, romanticization of nature and hunter-gatherers, there is good reason that we should look at those and what we could learn from that. So Hadza, twice as much protein as the USA. Carbohydrates were about 20% 20, 20 more than what the US standard American diet was. So 65% of their diet was carbs and 46% of the US diet was carbs. So that's very, very interesting. Now here's another very, very interesting. Just 11% of the Hadza's diet was uh, fat, dietary fat. 42% of the USA diet was fat. So incredibly interesting. So ultimately, it's very well established that the number of calories really dictates how, you know, uh, our, our, our adipose tissue, the weight we gain or the weight we lose. That's probably not up for argument. But however, the macronutrient profile of the things you are eating, the things that are available will certainly influence the number of carbs that you'll be able to eat, nutrient density, the macronutrients, micronutrients that are involved with those, very, very important, which are often, I think, undervalued in the kind of health and fitness culture a lot of us might be involved in. We're just focused on calories in, calories out, without paying attention to the very, very important nutri micronutrients, peptides, all of these very, very important things in our dietary composition. And, you know, if you are eating a very low protein diet, and certain, um, certain amounts of these micronutrients might be only present in high-protein foods, for example, so you will be likely getting less of those. So it's very interesting to see an actual macronutrient breakdown of those. One very interesting thing with that is the number of carbohydrates consumed as well. So it's very, very rich. The primarily their diet is a lot of protein and a lot of carbohydrates, which, you know, for a long time, carbohydrates have been somewhat demonized. Uh, people have found it easy, you know, it's it's easy to overconsume carbohydrates in that regard. So it is 
an easy target to pick but metabolically they may not be the issue this article also goes into the level of activity that the hunter-gatherer tribes go through so they're looking at literally some days six to nine hours of just physical activity so quite a bit more than we would be used to in industrial societies <coughs> so one Another aspect was the total energy expenditure during the day was actually quite similar to uh, adults in the USA. So it wasn't really the kind of lack of movement or the energy they're expending. It was really the composition of their diet. Now, that would be obvious to some people, but it never, you know, there was a rising obesity pandemic in most countries. Ireland, for example, is similar. So it always bears about reiterating the quality of food is very, very important. And of course, the macronutrient profile and caloric density. Now, there is a whole host of things that you go into in this article. I think there's a lot of things you could read in this. I think if you're in any way interested in this, I would highly recommend you go look at these and have a read of them. But there is one interesting passage that I just want to bring up and I thought was quite interesting is the role of honey in hunter-gatherers' diet. So we just never hear of honey being that kind of sexy food substance, you know, in Western societies or industrial. Mostly we see just honey poured on people's morning as acacia berries or their porridge or whatever, their acacia bowls or whatever the fuck you call it. But we never really hear them talk about it in this much. However, first, the Murdoch entries do not include information on honey composition. This oversight is important because honey accounts for a substantial portion of the diet for many hunter-gatherer groups. For example, among the Hadza, Marlowe and colleagues have estimated that honey accounts for approximately 15% of energy, ranging monthly from 1 to 50%. So 50% of their daily energy could have been made up from honey. That's, uh, that's just a lot to think on, like how useful was honey? Should we be eating more honey? Is there intrinsic properties to honey that is useful? Is honey just a source of carbohydrates and is it relevant? Is the glucose and fructose mix, mix uh, just something... Is there something unique to that? Some people would argue yes. Others would just say it's simply those carbohydrates and they're irrelevant to the equation. Very, very interesting though, I think. More, more zoomed out than that though is that, you know, the carbs shouldn't be demonized essentially if you are maybe earning them. All right, so again, as we've seen, there's loads of interesting things in these and loads of noteworthy points, but I think we, I think I've covered more of the kind of interesting ones I found interesting. If you have any thoughts on those, let it, in the comments, feel free to let me know. Lastly, we're going to move to the last kind of positive point or the last kind of interesting note from this that I thought was very, very interesting and fits it as well. So it is number four. Lastly, we'll move on to the last kind of good point of this review or the last good point of the interesting aspects. So man-made surfaces barricade the release of free radicals, a vital anchoring process to improve overall health, sleep quality, blood flow, mood and mental stability. So there is 4 and 29, and well, let's go take a look at number 4. In PubMed, which we've all heard of, NCBI, National Centre of Biological Technical Information, it is on earthing or grounding yourself. So honestly now, if you'd said earthing to me for grounding prior to probably reading some of this research stuff, I would have been like, that's nonsense, um, you know. There's surely no evidence to earthing or grounding. You know, people talk about their ions or electrons transferring to the earth, but... This is essentially a meta-analysis of grounding or earthing. It's called earthing, health implications of reconnecting the human body to earth's surface electrons. Now there's a variety of different, so this is essentially a meta-analysis or a combination of different articles. There is looking at sleep, stress, pain, cortisol, uh, difference between grounding control groups. Now obviously I didn't read all of the articles that they're referencing the study, so I didn't go into one of those, but there is quite a few of them that they reference. They seem to be using reasonably rigorous tests, or, well, not rigorous tests, but I would say worthwhile tests, tests that would produce notable events or results. For example, there is earthing reduces electric fields induced on the body. There is earthing looking at sleep, reduction in overall stress levels and tensions and shift in ANS balance, confirming shifts from sympathetic to parasympathetic activation immune cell and pain response to late onset muscle soreness induction. There's investigations into the pH and the substrate which, which particular endogenous enzymes are active in. So they're looking at the changes in pH um, due to the electrical environment that the pH is in. And subsequently, as any biological or 
biology students will know that the activity or the DPH of the environment will subsequently increase or decrease the activity of some enzymes. In other cases, it will denature the enzymes or have undesired consequences. The arguments they're making in some parts of this, which I thought were quite interesting, was that the changes after grounding positively affect the environment with which certain enzymes activate due to the changing of a favorable pH. I'll just read a little quote from it. So we can predict that such chain we can predict that such charge differentials will influence biochemical and physiological processes. First, the structure and functioning of many enzymes are sensitive to local environmental conditions. Each enzyme has an optimal pH that favors maximal activity. A change in the electrical environment can alter the pH of biological fluids and the charge distribution of molecules and thereby affecting reaction rates. The pH effects results be the pH effect results because of critical charged amino acids in the active site of the enzyme that participate in substrate binding and catalysis. In addition, the ability of a substrate or enzyme to donate or accept hydrogen ions is influenced by pH. So there's a lot in this kind of review article. I thought it was just very, very interesting that there was any legitimate science in regards to grounding. Um, I tried it last night, I'm not going to lie. Uh, I tried grounding before sleep because they said it positively influenced sleep. I don't have bad sleep, I sleep quite well, but I'm always looking for better sleep, faster, get to sleep, more deep sleep, more well rested the next day, wake up better. I'm always looking to get the most optimal sleep I can. So if this is something that is essentially free and if it is beneficial, I'll give it a go. And um, they have obviously articles in relation to quality of sleep, subjective sleep, and length of time spent to sleep. but. I feel like last night's sleep was quite a good night's sleep. It's something I'm going to try for a little bit longer and see what happens. Um, I would just encourage you to go read this and have a look at it. Uh, the fact that there's any research on earthing or grounding is, to be honest, mind-blowing. And slightly, uh, to be honest, it's pretty interesting that there's any research on it and people are taking it seriously. There's quite a bit of research on it and seems to have some biological effects. Um, yeah, I think that's that's... As the last good point, that is probably the most interesting aspect is that there's any research at all on that and if there is meaningful results from it. Now, unfortunately, we have to get to the bad or the just downright unscientific and uh, poor quality referencing. So first up is his claim to sleeping on hard ground or sleeping on a floor. So let's just go find that. Liver. Brian Johnson says, when they're not releasing hormone disrupting chemicals and off gassing flame retardants, their lock yields into one position, impeding our natural twists and turns that assist into building a robust muscular structure. To break new ground, sleep on it primal. <clears throat> so I saw 43 and I was like, all right, there's some kind of reference for this, there's some kind of research in relation to this. I am neutral to the idea of sleeping would be beneficial on hard ground would i go do it probably not i like my bed but if there was something interesting in it if there was something meaningful from it i would definitely have a think about it and take note of it so we go down to 43 and we find a men's health article but you can't be out here referencing men's health article you just cannot that's not a reference so it's called, I tried sleeping, the surprising health benefits of sleeping on a hard floor. I tried sleeping on a hard floor for a week. So basically what it is, is that in one of the men's health articles in 2017, one of the authors, Paul Kitta, basically slept on a foam tiny mattress on the floor for a week after the advice of some researcher who's been doing it for a few years, who wrote a book on it. Um, they didn't really seem to make a great argument for why you should sleep on the floor. I'm not really getting any positive benefits to it. If you if you go to the end of that article and you read what the men's health article says, uh, essentially he's saying that he didn't find any benefits from sleeping on the floor. They're saying it should take a few years. Uh, I'm skeptical of that claim. He essentially said he made no difference. His arguments are you don't have to buy an expensive mattress. Most of us will already have bought a mattress. He said eventually he got better sleep. Um, I sleep quite well on my mattress, so I don't know why I would change. I just don't see the argument for this. I, I understand that it's not really any negative impacts, but you can't be referencing a men's health article and telling people to sleep on the floor as a result of that. I don't see any positives to this. 
he didn't magically cure any injuries he didn't feel better in the gym the actual argument from the first source or the primary source article in this is that it you get some soft tissue work from sleeping on the hard ground so you essentially have foam rolling and soft tissue work from sleeping on the ground and it helps you recover even though he said he felt a little bit sore after some nights um I just do get some following, pay a therapist. There's some very, very good therapists out there. Get a new muscular therapist, someone who's very acclaimed in soft tissue work. Get a massage gun. They just do it and sleep on your mattress. So that brings us to the first of our kind of poor arguments or lack of quality argument in relation to uh, what he's referencing in the book. There's no real negatives to that, but I don't see the positives in, in encouraging that to someone. You'll see this again later. If you're going to reference something and there's a primary source, you need to reference a primary source. You can't just be referencing a men's health article. Now, sleeping on a hard floor was something that interested people in his social media, but isn't really crucial to his arguments of living a better lifestyle. Now, however, if we go to, if we go to something that's more fundamental to the arguments he makes in relation to, for example, a supplement company, but also to the factors or the, the food substances that make up his diet, which are a lot of organs. So early ancestor, animal foods, organs, and uh, glandulars in particular, behold centuries of brain, bone, and muscle development. Uh, early ancestral healers believed a healthy animal organ had the capacity to strengthen and support corresponding organs in the individual, a concept known as like supports like. So we get a reference for 16 there. If you go further down, in the spirit of like supports like, consume bone marrow for enhanced collagen production, stronger bones and connective tissue. We get 16 again. And there's one more reference to that later in it. So if we go down to that, we get spleen, 500 milligrams, 180 capsule, Dr. Ron's Ultra Pure retrieved, and it takes you to drrons.com. And all this takes you to is a desiccated organ, freeze dried, grass fed New Zealand beef organ from spleen. And it doesn't, it's not a review article, it's not even a men's health article, it's literally just a product that. I don't even think, I, like he doesn't even sell. Um, Brian Johnson doesn't sell this. This is not his website. This is just someone else called Dr. Ron Spleen. And if you go to the description, they just talk about freeze dried, the, the product they're selling, but there's no actual information. There's no studies. There's nothing in relation to the use of um, like supports like or the use of organs. Jesus, there's surely better references that could have been done. So we have another reference like that in the it is it turns out the nourishing tradition is backed by radioisotope labeling studies and justifies endurance of many native tribes plenty of whom selectively boosted reproduction rates by eating thyroid so if that's number 11 if we go to number 11 we're getting nutrition and physical generation a comparison of primitive and modern diets and their effects so this is a book so a book can be used as a primary source However, at bare minimum, you would need to reference the passage of the primary source in the book. However, there is the mention of studies from the primary source or the primary source reference. So in fact, that would not be your primary source. That would be where you would have come upon the information. But if you're doing due diligence and you're referencing something that references studies, you need to go back and find those studies and reference them, them and not the reference of a book. So this is written by Weston A. Price, which is a name will probably ring a lot of bells at some people. Uh, I've not read Nutrition and Physical Degeneration. It's something to be noteworthy of, but that doesn't support your argument. I would like to give him the benefit of the doubt and say that's an okay reference. However, you know, if you're going to be telling people to do a certain thing and you're going through a certain way of eating that people typically is different to what's currently mainstream, I think you should have better quality references and reference something that is meaningful in relation to this. I don't doubt that these studies exist, that these radio isotope labeling studies it would make sense. If you have a particular organ, it has a certain number of micronutrients and uh, other cofactors and enzymes that are needed for its optimal operation. It would make sense that an organ then and a corresponding animal that was related to those would have similar composition and thus that these would be used effectively. Amino acid profiles, for example, would be used effectively in that organ. Um, but I would expect a better reference than that in a book. 
I understand this is an ebook and more of a pamphlet, but there is a lot of scrutiny in regards to that style of eating. So I would hold the uh, standard higher, you know, and even if I do enjoy that way of eating, I still think you need to have better quality references than that. Then probably the last one that is a little bit wacky and it's a little bit tinfoil hatty, but in some ways it may make sense. So then it's in relation to EMF or electromagnetic fields. Now, you may have seen from his Instagram and stuff where he has like Faraday curtains. Um, so that the quote from his pamphlet or ebook is the adverse health effects are so abundant, uh, fatigue, loss of libido, anxiety, and depression, the return on investment more than justifies the effort. Magnetic fields can alter chemical reaction, reactions in the body. So go get them out of the cave at all costs. So if we look at that reference, number 21. 21 numbers up. It's from the WHO or the World Health Organization. Now, unfortunately, referencing the World Health Organization in recent times, usually the COVID the Rona, the pandemic, doesn't make doesn't make for great um, great reading. Uh, unfortunately, as it leaves a bad taste in people's mouth, especially that Taiwan China phone call. But they have a report: uh, radiation, electromagnetic fields. It's a full report. It's from practically the last twenty five years. Uh, essentially, they talk about that f there is more research on electric magnetic fields than there is on most chemicals. There's approximately about 25,000 different research articles in relation to electromagnetic fields. And the consensus is that they are, by and large, very safe, or by and large, safe, unless you, for example, sit inside your microwave. So there is no doubt that there is a biological effect from electromagnetic fields. Now, if there's adverse health effects from those biological effects, the answer is no from the vast majority of the research. Uh, there's a good quote in this, and I'm just gonna find it there. It is not disputed that electromagnetic fields above certain levels can trigger biological effects. Uh, experiments with healthy volunteers that short-term exposure at the levels present in the environment or in the home do not cause any apparent detrimental effects. Exposure to higher levels that might be harmful are restricted by national and international guidelines. The current debate is centered on whether long-term low level exposure can evoke biological responses and influence people's well-being. The conclusions from scientific research in the area of biology effects and medical applications of non-ionizing radiation approximately 25,000 articles have been published over the last 30 years despite the feeling of some people that more research needs to be done scientific knowledge in this area is now more extensive than for most chemicals based on recent in-depth review of the scientific literature the who concluded that current evidence does not confirm the existence of any health consequences from exposure to low-level EMFs. However, some gaps in knowledge about biological effects exist and need further research. They go on to talk on the particular quality research, the research been done, why the EMF was set up. It's obviously phenomenal that it was researched, it's phenomenal that a lot of effort has gone into it. It's great that a lot of great minds have put a lot of effort into that. The overwhelming majority of the research in this report is saying that they are basically okay unless you basically sit inside a microwave or you're exposed to ionizing radiation which you would know because you might be near a nuclear reactor you might smell one of Fitz's farts or you might be near a hydrogen bomb for example i don't really get this link because this directly or almost directly contradicts what brian johnson is saying in relation to its effect on your fatigue loss of libido loss of libido anxiety and depression this is not a it's directly in in conflict with what he is saying I, I just don't get that one so there's kind of sloppy references some of these some of the more interesting ones are very very useful to see and I'm, it's um, it's nice to have been introduced to them however those poorer references i think you know muddy the water a little bit and um, adding stuff in like that if you're going to reference anything i commend the effort and i think it is commendable and if you have weighted references then it's a good job however if you're referencing things like men's health articles or directly referencing reports that contradict what you're saying, it's not a good look. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed this. Make up your own mind in relation to the nutritional lifestyle and lifestyle you wish to live. I'm not trying to positively influence you in any way. I am just trying to go through what is very, very popular at the moment. Um, personal opinions aside, I think um, 
an interesting character at the moment. It'll be interesting to see where he ends up. He's over a million followers on Instagram already since like last uh, autumn, which is an incredible rise to fame. So I thought it'd be useful to get this done. If you enjoyed it, let me know. If you saw anything that was particularly interesting, then I'd be glad to hear it. And if you know Brian Johnson personally and you've some derogatory stories about him, I'd be all ears as well because, you know, everyone likes a bad story about famous people, don't they? Don't they, Fitz? They really do. They do. They do. Thanks, guys, for watching. Again, not here to tear Brian Johnson down in any way or in relation. As I said, I use the supplements from his company. Uh, but, you know, if you're going to put out scientific stuff or do an appearance of scientific, then I suppose be prepared to have some kind of rigor or some kind of uh, measuring stick held against it.